All right, my friends, we are back. It's Sunday night, December 6th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We're with Don Dunn of HD 2020. He's better known. If you guys don't remember Don, he was a he was a really famous guy in the 80s. He was Jackson! Jackson! All right, Gargamel. All right, I'll give you that. Once you see it, you'll never unsee it. Uh, You're right, you're right. So we got a special guest, Don. Let's be kind of kind tonight. Don't scare this guy away, all right? Oh, shit, come on. (laughs) He's right here. He's right here. We got Jason Dustel. Hey, guys. I'm saying it right. Jason Dustel, right? Yeah. So Jason, the reason why we have Jason on here, we're actually very happy that he's here, and we thank you in advance, Jason, for joining the Audioholics team. Yeah. Here's the problem with Audioholics. Audioholics is all audio, but we gotta bring some. We gotta bring some video, video vice viciousness to this, uh, uh, to what we're doing here. And Jason's got the credentials. Jason's not only ISF certified; he's an ISF instructor. Yeah. Worked very closely with Joel Silver. What's that? Protege of Joe Silver, like a son to him. (laughs) So you were the Padawan. (laughs) Yeah, Joe. uh, I've I've consider Joel a, a great friend and a mentor for uh, over a decade easily. Um, right. I, I started in the industry very young cause I just, I took hold of it and uh, luckily just uh, had him and a couple other people worth mentioning, Jeff Murray and Bob Fucci and Matt Murray and uh, just uh, grown up with these guys. And they've been, you know, they've been part of my world for the last decade and I've been very, very lucky. It's been a super, super fun. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the triumvirate of video. Those are the <laughs> guys. It kind of, yeah. it kind of is. But you know, you're you're exactly right, Gene. We we want to take the audio holics. We want we want to turn all of the audio files into video files and make them a video files. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because we spend I spend a lot of time educating people on proper setup of your speakers, proper sure. placement of your subwoofers, equalization, yep. room acoustics. But now it's time to take that knowledge up a level to the video area. That's where you come in. We talk about you know projector calibration tv calibration getting your black levels right 4k 8k all that stuff so i want to basically go over a kind of a primer tonight on the things we want to be covering on this channel first thing i want to talk to you about is everybody is like going nuts over this hdmi 2.1 oh yeah bug bug (laughs) people are saying they want to file class action lawsuits because they just bought a receiver i mean come on guys Come on, really? You're going to follow. The thing is working for everything you're doing right now. And Don, that's what I have a question for you. How many yes. installs are you doing today that go beyond um, that go beyond 4K? How many are you doing that are 4K 120? Anything many- gig? Probably not. It's not a, well, it's, it's, it's not a thing. I mean, we, we try to bring our systems up to the point of diminishing returns where it's a, a functional and reliable technology we're always actually pretty cautious about stepping into new technologies. For instance, 1080p came out. It took years to have any 1080p content. It was insane. So with 4K, we've kind of t- taken baby steps because we, and Jason is the man on this. It's kind of serendipity in a way, but we do a lot of distributed video. And Jason is the national sales and our training manager for the primary company, AV Pro Edge, that we use. So we're always, and, and I, I see AV Pro Edge as well kind of cautiously stepping onto the bleeding edge because people pay us, they want reliability. They don't care to reboot this and do that. So that's more or less what we do. It, guys, it's it's a big circle. I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, I remember when 1080p 24 was a big thing. 1080p 3D was a big thing. 4K was a big thing. 4K with HDR is a big thing. And we just, you know, every five years or so, we just keep going in these circles and circles and circles. And we're here again with 8K and, and high frame rate and, HDMI 2.1 and you know it's just it the industry is always evolving and we're always growing and this is just another stepping stone that's all but the things that we're seeing so far have been very promising yes there's been some hiccups it's very early it's first generation it's the wild west of course as it always is when there's a new format but we're here and and we're taking care of it and we're learning a lot every day and the things that we're seeing so far I've seen some AK 120 stuff in HDR native that's really blown me away. It's been really, really cool so far. So what what have you seen AK on? Like what kind of a source was that? Was that a Blu-ray disc, an HD Blu-ray disc, or was it a streaming thing? What did you see that on? Not, nothing yet on disc. It's all kind of proprietary um, uh, demo material, if you will, or, or files, if you will. I actually, uh, Gene, I'm happy to share them with you if you'd like, but 
Um, if you go back and look at the AV Pro YouTube page from about June or July or so, I had on a guest, uh, Florian Friedrich, who's been kind of on the cutting edge of 8K as far as content creation. And he's been shooting in 8K for about two or three years now. And he gave us a couple of clips. Uh, he took some NASA, like International Space Station footage, and uh, he cleaned it up. It looks really, really good. It's all in HDR. It's all in 8K native. Um, wow. It's really, really good looking material. And, you know, a, a lot of people, you know, we, we, we heard the same things with 4K, right? It's like, you're not going to use it. You're not going to see it. Only if you're sitting an inch away from the screen, right? We've, we've mm -hmm. heard these things in the past. But um, the thing I'll tell you about 8K, um, when you're working with that many pixels and you're trying to upscale, you can do a lot of really good damage when, when you have that many pixels to work with. So even taking things that are 1080p or 4K and upping into 8K with all the AI stuff that's going on right now and all the smart upscaling that's going on right now, this stuff looks really, really cool. And when you see the native 8K stuff, it's it's even better. We're, we're starting to see some really interesting things right now, to say the least. So would you do the upscaling? Let, let's talk about upscaling. If you have um, a 1080p signal or 4K, would you always do the upscaling at the display device or would you do it at the source it, device? It, it, that's the million dollar question, right? You have how many devices in your system do you have that can potentially upscale the system or upscale the signal? You've got a source, you've got an AVR, you might have a matrix switch, you might have a display. So every everything in that signal chain is going to want to play its native format as best as it can. So if that 8K is in the TV or in the source, uh, it really just depends. And the, the million dollar question is, which device in my system do I let do all the upscaling? And you really have to test. And there's a couple of different images that we use and there's a couple of different test patterns that we use to really look at, you know, if I, if I put 1080p into the system and upscale it to 4K or 8K, or if I put 4K into the system and upscale it to 8K, you know, which device in the system is actually doing the, the heavy lifting and, and the work of taking that low res signal, upping it to high res and making it show on this the display as the display's native resolution. So you really just have to kind of like look at the system and say, if, am I going to do my upscaling in the player or the receiver or, the, or am I just going to let the TV do everything? And the honest answer is, I don't know. I have to look at some test patterns. I have to look at some images that I know really well, and I have to let the system let me know which device is going to do the upscaling. So well, let's it, assume, let's assume in a perfect world that we have the ability to pass 8k right now. Right. Um, in the past, we've used discs like Spears and Munsell, which are for mm -hmm. 4k and for 1080p. Mm -hmm. What kind of source material, calibration material is there available now for consumers, or do you have to go and hire a pro if you really want to get the good 8K experience? Get right the now, there's nothing, there's nothing there's, right? There, there's a handful of clips out there. I talked about Florian's clips. Um, there's nothing yet on disc. There's nothing yet streaming. There's, uh, I've, I've seen some talks about some 8K stuff maybe on YouTube coming pretty soon, but um, we still don't quite yet have a real... 8k generator where we can put real 8k test patterns up on a screen um we don't have them today are they coming of course they're coming um meridio our our company that we use that manufactures test equipment uh we have a generator right now that is hopefully by the end of the year we're really aiming for the end of the year to have some 8k uh output some 48 gig you know real hdmi 2.1 as a as a signal generator to get us test patterns to let us know if these displays are doing what they're supposed to do. We had something very, um, I'll call it, <laughs> I'll call it elementary. Um, last year at CDS, so 2019, we had a signal generator that was basically two boards stacked on top of each other, no chassis, no nothing. And we were outputting some 8K um, test patterns to a Sony 8K display. So we're very, very, very close to being able to really get down and dirty and really being able to look at some of the 8K displays in their native resolution. But again, as Don sort of pointed out before, we've done this before. When the 4K TVs were new, we were taking a bunch of 1080p test patterns and just pump them into the 4K system and letting something upscale and just looking at it that way. So we still have a little bit of 4K, you know, material yeah. to go from. It's limited. It'll, yeah, it'll take a little bit of time, just like it did with 4K and just like it did with 3D and just like it did with 1080p 24. It'll take a little bit of time, but we're very, very close to getting there. I can see, see us seeing some really cool um, 
HDMI 2.1, 8K, 120, 12-bit, like really cool stuff here in the next six months for sure. See, what's, what concerns me about that is two things. Number one, we don't have 12-bit displays. Right. Okay, all, all the current 8K displays on the market are 10 bits, all and they only, they only go up to 40 gigabits. They can't even use the 48 gig. gig. Right. Not that we're going to use that today. The yeah. other concern of the fact is we're barely streaming 4K good now. I mean, if you look, Netflix has come a long way, like, Five years ago, I thought Netflix sucked because it was so <laughs> pixelated. It did. <laughs> it did. But it's still a 4K on Netflix is still nowhere near 4K on an Ultra HD Blu-ray disc. Right. Yeah, it's 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 not. And you can easily see that when you smash the info button on your Blu-ray remote and you see the data rates coming in. I mean, I you pop in a movie like Gemini Man or 1917 or any of these movies, and they're doing 80, 100 megabits per second. Whereas, you know, you watch that same movie or even something similar on Netflix or whatever, and you're getting nowhere near that. So the data rates and stuff are still going to always be better on disk. And we're always going to be um, advocating and, and, and telling people, like, if you really enjoy this movie or you really enjoy this TV show, buy the disk. But as we're talking about all this 8K stuff, uh, and the honest truth is we really don't know what's going to happen with with physical media when it comes to 8K. They're, they're, just like with vinyl, there's only so much information you can shove onto that disc. Mm -hmm. So, you know, doing 8K 120, a full feature film with behind the scenes footage and with all you know different languages and this and that, it's not going to fit on the disc. So we're still sort of kind of feeling out like what's going to happen in the future when it comes to that. In my personal opinion, I think that most of that really high def and, 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 and really big dose gigantic files are probably going to be streaming. Especially with the new move that uh, that Hollywood's making now yeah. to stream movies direct to T, yeah. you know, HBO Max. That's a big blow. I don't want to go off on a tangent, but that's no. a big blow. In my opinion, that's a big blow to the movie industry because and it, it's going to help us it, for it, sure. It, it, it's going to make that it, technology evolve quicker. And yeah. you know, how many times, guys? And you, you know, you guys have seen this a million times, just like I have. But how many times over the past twenty years have we seen a some kind of company try to capitalize on this? you know, movies in the theater, in your home sort of concept. Oh, escape. <laughs> it, it's right. It's and it, there's been several of them and, you know, it's always been very expensive and it's always been for the elite type of home theater customer. And, you know, the movie is a thousand dollars. You only get it for eight hours and you have to have this $40,000 server and yada, 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 yada. And for the first time ever, the average person, the people who are watching this video are going to be able to watch a, a first run Hollywood movie in their home when it comes out. It's completely new. It's completely different. And I, I, I must say, I do have a couple of things that I'm concerned about. Number one is what are people watching these movies on? Are they watching them on just TVs they bought at whatever store and they're on the factory settings? Are they watching them on their iPads? Are they watching them on their phones? And guys, I cannot stress enough when that movie is color graded and made to look a certain way, that's how that movie looks in the theater, right? And then that same exact movie is color graded and 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 mastered for a Blu-ray disc. And that's how you watch that Blu-ray disc at home. But if we're streaming these Hollywood movies and people have these TVs and projectors that are on the factory settings with energy savings turned on and vivid mode turned on and motion interpolation turned on, they're not seeing the movie correctly. So it is unbelievably important today to right. let people understand that at least get that projector or that TV that you're watching at home, at least get it into a better mode. So when you're watching that first run, you know, first print of that Hollywood movie, it doesn't look like some weird cartoon fake version of the movie. It looks at least somewhat close to what they wanted it to look like. What do you think right. about products that have ISF built into them, like the Epson sixty fifty projector? You think that I gets mean, us close? It it's it's kind of close, right? I mean, the, these are still mass produced, you know, coming off the assembly line at you know one per second, you know, type of thing, and they don't have the time or the energy or the money at the factory to measure every single one of those projectors or every single one of those TVs that comes off the off the assembly line. So the whole point is you take that projector, you take that TV home and you put it in an ISF mode and it's fairly close. And the ISF mode lets somebody like me come over and really dive deep into that menu and adjust nine gazillion little tiny things to really dial that picture in. And then best case scenario, I can lock the mode 
That way, you know, somebody can't go in there and accidentally reset it or accidentally lower the contrast or accidentally break it. Nice. So let me ask you this now, people, gamers, for example, these, mm -hmm. I think the gamers are the most vocal about this 8K HDMI 2.1 bug. Yeah. So I guess right now the workaround is we don't know what the manufacturers are going to do because the Panasonic chipsets, they don't have a solution yet. So we don't know if they're going to change the chipset or if it's, it's definitely, it sounds like it's not going to be a firmware fix. They're probably got to send their receivers back and get them updated. But in the, in the meantime, can we simply just use HDMI eARC? Like we've been promised that HDMI 2.1 eARC is going to be lossless. So you could get true HD over Atmos. You can get at least 18 gigabits of bandwidth going to it. Why not just plug the gaming console directly into one of your ports on your HDMI 2.1 TV and then send the audio back to your receiver? What am I missing? Is there going to be a propagation problem on the TV? No. Is there going to be too much delay or is it going to be good? No. The, the, the good, the great news about eARC is it doesn't work like ARC works. ARC works, ARC relies on CEC, eARC does not. It has its own lane, it has its own channel, it does everything on its own. And it's uncompressed, as you mentioned before. So if you're having problems right now with some HDMI 2.1 AVR, it's not passing this or it's not passing that, just go around it, it's okay. You can use something as simple as an HDMI splitter or a matrix switch, send the video straight to the TV, send the audio straight to the AVR, and you're good. There's no big deal there at all. And, you know, it's early. And as you said, maybe this will be fixed with firmware. Maybe it's a hardware thing and we have to wait till next year. But um, it's it's early, guys. You know, it's like it, it's like the guy who goes out and buys the brand new 2020 Corvette. And, you know, there's some weird thing with the transmission. Well, guess what? They fix it in 2021 and everybody's happy. We're dealing with the same stuff right now. It's extremely early. So, you know, those early adopters, we love them. We appreciate them. I sometimes tend to be an early adopter depending on what it is. But these are the folks who are driving us forward. And, and we love the early adopters. Don't get me wrong. But there's always that risk of some weird little quirky thing like what we're seeing right now with Dolby Vision, for example, with the LG CX. You know, there's these weird little quirky things that will be worked out with time, but it's it's early. You know what I have to say? I have to give Yamaha credit because Yamaha is a kind of company where, you know how most receivers, they, their life cycles are eight months and they come out with new yeah. models. Yep. Well, Yamaha flagship stuff like their Avantage processor, they only refresh that once every five years. Yep. So it was smart for them to, to start with HDMI 2.1 on their lowest entry level Avantage receivers, mm -hmm. deal with the hiccups there. And then when that, module is perfected you put it in the flagship products yeah and and usually it's the opposite as you guys have all seen in the past they'll start with their halo product and they'll shove everything into the high-end flagship product and let it kind of trickle down and hopefully it works but i like that that they're kind of doing it the opposite because if it works in the low end i don't want to say low end that sounds bad but if it works in the yeah. entry level product it'll definitely eventually work in the mid-level and, and the in the high-end stuff that that uh, that all the the geeks that, that are watching this video are gonna really want, but it's it, again, guys, it's it's super early. Um, there's a there's a lot still to learn, and you know the manufacturers are doing their best. Uh, I'll tell you that for sure. And you know we're, we're hearing all this hubbub about oh, it's only 40 gigs, it's not really 48 gigs, and it's really kind of blowing my mind because people are really upset about that. But at the end of the day, there's like four formats that are over 40 gigs uncompressed. And we're talking like 10K 60 and 8K uh, 120 with 12 bit and 444 and just all these completely like out of, I'll say out of reach, but out of reach formats for right now. The whole reason that they made HDMI 2.1 so robust is because they want it to be a system that we grow into for the next 20 years. So when you see manufacturers right now doing stuff at only, only 40 gigs, stop freaking out it's okay we're gonna yeah. see a, we're gonna see a stepping stone from 18 to 24 to like 30 mm -hmm. 32 and then eventually into 42 and 44 and 48 but there's nothing to worry about right now when it comes to to hdmi 2.1 and bandwidth if something's only claiming 40 gigs right now mm -hmm. trust me guys it's okay at least for the next few years yeah as an integrator it's um something that we're always battling because people will read about 
these emerging technologies or new upgrades. HDMI has been the bane of our existence. You know that as an integrator. It, when HDMI first came out, we tried to dis, uh, use distribution on it. It was a nightmare. Um, companies have really stepped up and grown and, and given us products that are solid. But people read about these new technologies and, and they're doing their due diligence and I don't blame them. But sure. I always tell my clients, let's get to the state of the art that's reliable and robust that we can use. That's going to give you some growth. Then down the road, let's build an, um, an infrastructure of wiring that will support upgrading yeah. further. When it's feasible, you don't need to spend the extra money now. I mean, you know as well as I do, the 8K is relatively silly. I mean, it's just, it's got to grow. I mean, you know, right. I wouldn't yeah. buy a product. If I, that wouldn't even be in my spectrum if I was going to buy a receiver or some kind of um, a preamplifier right now. Right. Maybe a modular changing system, like something like, NAD has, but uh, it just stay where you can actually use the product, uh, use the technology and enjoy it. And you so know, that, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just get. I just want to point out one thing and Don's exactly right. When you talk about future proofing and wiring and infrastructure, that's really it. If I'm building a house today, guess what I'm running? I'm running cat six. I'm running fiber. I'm, I'm actually probably going to run duplex fiber. I'm right. going to leave maybe the fiber dark for the next two or three years. That's okay. Right. It's there. So when it does come time, when I'm going to be using 40 gigs or 48 gigs in the next five, 10 years, the fiber is already there. So integrators out there like Don, the smart ones are mm -hmm. running fiber. They're installing conduit and they're getting the systems. Sometimes ready. We're running fiber. Fiber. <laughs> really Sometimes we're, run we're running fiber at key locations. We're running Smurf too, because a fiber is super. I mean, B, we don't right. know what fiber we're going to need. And if, you know? if you're not running fiber, that's okay. Run some conduit. That way, when it comes time to do fiber in the next seven years, you just have something to yank through. It's no big deal. I've, I've been to so many jobs where it's it, I, I'm there for a calibration and the customer's expecting HDR, the customer's expecting 4K and all this great stuff. And the house was built in 1995 and it's got Cat5 in it. And it just does not, it, it's not capable of handling that type of signal. And you guys don't want to be, ripping out walls and ripping out ceilings for the next 10 years in your homes. So please, 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 if you're not running fiber and cat six now, that's okay. Please run conduit. That's all I'm saying. So Absolutely. that's one thing that, that really impressed me when Don and HD 2020 came to my, the new audio Hawk smart house, I assumed we were going to run HDMI everywhere because that's mm -hmm. what I did. That's what I did mm -hmm. in this house. Right. Instead, sure. much smarter. We ran three cat sixes to each, uh, display location Perfect. and we have conduit Perfect. between yeah. the, the between the racks so right. we have future upgradability so and, and that's the thing i wanted to ask you about so we're going to be in in the audio hook smart house we're going to have all of our source devices pretty much centrally located in a rack upstairs in the office right then we're going to use an av pro edge um distribution network an hdmi yeah. distribution network <laughs> nice yes so <laughs> let me ask you let me ask yeah. you right now does eight does the av pro edge does it support true HD over Atmos if I'm running, um, you know, if I'm running Atmos through a Blu-ray player and then sending it to another receiver? Is it supporting lossless? Yeah. It, one of the things that we're super proud about with AV Pro and, and Meridio, our, our test equipment brand, um, we've worked for years with all the Dolby folks. So as far as all the codecs and being able to pick up all those signals in our test equipment, we're 100% ready to rock and roll when it comes to, to Dolby stuff and, and all the high res uh, formats. And you pay your royalty. <laughs> what that? You what? And, and you pay your royalties. Well, I mean, it's you know that's it, that's just part of the game, right? But you know, we work real close with those guys. We have meetings with them, you know, on a regular basis, and and they're super fun to talk to and super fun to work with. And uh, yeah, we're super proud about that. Is you know, all of our stuff is, um, you know, that's kind of that's kind of one of our biggest things that we're proud about is that we are always trying to build equipment that's really on that kind of bleeding edge and and, and we're definitely doing that i mean we we built a we built a, a don i don't know if you've used this in any of your systems yet but we built a dolby ditch uh, we built a dolby atmos down mixer like two years ago right, so right. If you had a, a theater room and next to the theater room you had a restroom or a little kind of a lobby area you could split the signal off the theater room and pump two channel oh, into the stereo, audio yeah, stereo and, plate being able to now mix that Dolby signal was impossible up until about two years ago. But just working with those guys and getting the licensing all figured out and getting all the technology figured out, figured out, you know, we work real close with them and, and we're 
um, you know, we're, we're, we're definitely on top of that type of stuff for sure. I mean, AV pro edge is a company that's just out of the box thinkers. I mean, they use their own protocols. They're, they're, they're doing things with reliability in mind and also performance in mind. And that's, you know, HDMI distribution is, is a, is a critical thing because once you locate everything in one rack, you're sending that signal out to different monitors or TVs in different areas. It's not funny to people. I mean, this is broadcast quality stuff. Yeah. And tech support, the the little things, little idiosyncrasies, like the size of the uh, the, oh, the, uh, the extenders or the squid wrap. That's a yeah. genius. We we yeah. can't do a project without a squid the squid wrap. Yeah. I mean, just to rack that whole all of the two piece extenders and shares a power supply and save space on a rack. It's little things like that. I mean, bravo to, and especially after meeting Jeff and, and everybody, man, and it's just a great company. Yeah. If well, you, any of you ever send HDMI over a hundred feet, man, this is, or this is the, these are the guys. It, the, the thing you have to remember about our company specifically is that we started off with like the ISF and, and video quality has been like the core of what we do. Uh, we've, you know, Joel has been friends with Jeff and they've done lots and lots of business together over, over the years since the nineties. Right. So when, uh, when the Murray's decided that they were going to build a company that dealt with connectivity products and test equipment, who was right there next to them, giving them advice, it was Joel silver. So wow. when, when we build matrix switches and extenders and, and we talk about, how we preserve picture quality and we preserve the data and yada, 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 all that great stuff. Like our, our goal as a company is to get the most pristine signal from point A to point B, no matter how far away it is. And we take that stuff very seriously. It's cool. super, super easy to extend a signal. Anybody can do it. You right. can buy a $75 extender off Amazon, but to do it correctly, oh, with all the data preserved and to, to, to do HD base T, especially in such a way that, you can't see that it's HD based T is right. kind of tough to do. And that's really where we shine. And uh, we, we just came from, that. he came from Syncor and the, the, the company that created the very equipment that ISF used to measure. I mean, that that's, you can't get a bigger technical background than that. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, the, the company was born out of calibration and test equipment. And, Here. you know, when, in 2015, uh, they came up with an 18 gigabit per second 4K HDR signal generator. That was 2015, so they were way right. ahead of the game. Right. And you know, once you're, the funny thing about this is, is once you're able to test a signal, it's really easy to figure out how to build an extender. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's like if you can see the integrity of this signal and you can tell what's good with it and what's bad with it, you can really easily wrap your mind around making an extender and, and then eventually making a matrix switch. And that's sort of how, how the company grew. But again, it's all about picture quality. It's all about preserving the original intent. It's about of reliability too, man. I, look, cause I, reliability is key. And to be able to handle power fluctuations, especially in a hostile environment that Florida creates. Oh yeah. I mean, and overall HD uh, AV pro edge has been the most reliable. And you know how much we put in, we put in tons of, and and just incredibly robust and reliable and and a fantastic warranty. I mean, going to be a with a ten year warranty <laughs> with a ten year. It's just a fantastic product, and I yeah. I've been accused of being a fanboy, but listen, this is how I feed my family. I pay my bills, and and my clients pay us. Right. And I take very seriously the the choices of product that I choose for each job. I choose them on performance. I choose them right. on you know a. a uh, if they're a good value and also on reliability and, and we right. won't even consider another AV distribution product just because of, and we've tried many of them. So anyway, sure, it's a love fest, but it's a, it's a great, it's a great product, man. And it, and it just makes a lot, puts a lot of smiles on people. No, that's, that's good to hear. And you know, we're, we're definitely on top of things. We've got, um, I, I kind of mentioned before, we've got the HDMI 2.1 signal generator, very, very close to being ready. Um, we already have a HDMI 2.1 uh, distribution amplifier. I think it's a one in, four out, if I'm not mistaken. We right we just got that in the lab from from the from the factory. You know, that's another that's another important thing to point out too is we own the factory. So if we want to make something, or if we get a request yeah. from a customer, a customer being somebody like Don, an integrator, who says, "Hey, we really love this switch, or we really love this extender, but we wish it could do this." Okay, great. Let's do a firmware update to it real quick and let's make it do it. You know, we well, can do that, those things 
things almost on the fly, which is really cool. Yeah, but yeah, but but like like I said, guys, we're 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 really on top of this stuff, and and we're very very close to having some. Uh, we've already got some 8K test patterns. We've already got some ways of of looking at some of these 8K displays, but uh, we just don't quite yet have the sources. But we're like this close to it. Hmm. So you you brought up Don. You brought up a very important point on when you select equipment to go into a job. Besides performance, you also worry about durability and reliability. Aesthetics, and reliability, reliability. The reliability okay. thing to me, the reliability thing to me is a is a big thing because not all HDMI solutions through different AV receivers are created equal. And well, you know, no, some of the no. companies that are really on top of it. I know people are wanting to give Yamaha and Sound United a black eye right now for the HDMI 2.1, but there's a reason why they're the only two companies right now with HDMI 2.1. It's because they are on the cusp. Right. The cusp. They're sticking their necks out. New technology. They well, have bulletproof HDMI interfaces already. Well, you look still at make Sound right. I mean, they'll they always make right. Both of yeah. those companies. Are fantastic. But you look at you look at what Sound United has done, and I've been to some of their trainings and. Their HDMI platform is bulletproof, man. I mean, they even have an HDMI diagnostic mode where you could plug a cable in and you could right. test the cable to make right. sure it can pass 4K. Yeah, I mean, we helped we helped them with that, and we were super happy that they were going to incorporate that cable wow. test with their AVRs. I mean, you know, a lot of that stuff came from like our you know our generator analyzer combination that we have. You know, you plug in a cable and you sm smash two buttons, and you know right away if that cable can do 18 gigs or not. And, you know, th these are the, these are the headaches that people like Don are running into in the field and especially the end users. They don't know what to buy and they don't know what their cable cable is capable of. So the fact that they're building that into the AVR is, is I mean, hats off to them. That's really, really cool that they're doing that. Dude, you know, what's really cool is you join in this team. Um, you know, we were truly trying to cover the full gamut. We have the the electrical engineering and audio background and, and yeah. ability to test that Gene has. You know, as an integrator and in an audio file for 30 years, the real world solutions and how it works. And, and with you, you bring that missing piece to the of the puzzle, you know, for, for all of our followers and people out there that because video has always been this mysterious thing. And, and, and my, most of the video reviews and talk is are fluff or they just talk science above people's heads. And you're able to it, really. It's not guys. It, video and audio are almost exactly the same. We have you know, waves flying through the air, right? right? And we have these sensors are picking up a certain right. frequency from here to here. These right. sensors are picking up another frequency here to here. It's all energy. It's all physics. Right. It's all about the same when it comes down to it at the end of the day. What, guys, uh, uh, just pop quiz. When you're talking about attributes of sound quality, what's the most important thing? What making, are you making what you see viscerally... Well, you I mean, like when 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 you're judging an audio system oh, okay. you know what one, oh, one of the yeah. one of the first things you we all talk about is dynamic range right yeah. it's in and, the recording and neutrality it's in the system it's in the speakers you know it's all about dynamic range well guys guess what million dollar question what's the most important thing to a video system uh, dynamic, dynamic range, range. <laughs> it's you know yeah. so we start talking about some of this stuff as as we as we take it in as human beings and it's all the same. We want good dynamic range. We want a good amount of color. We want the right color. We want the picture to be clear and sharp and easy to see. With audio, we want dynamic range. We want we want a, a, a colorful sound. We want it to sound enveloping. We want it to be imaged correctly. We want the sound stage to be good. We want the clarity to be good. So, you know, with, with audio and video, it's really just four or five little things that we're worried about. Now, how we figure those things out and measure them are, you know, all completely different, of course. But at the right. end of the day, as human beings, these sensors and these sensors are all looking for the same thing. Yeah. You're right. It's about the holistic experience. So I, I, I kind of first met Jason and brought him into one of the theater rooms that I did. We had like a the twenty five thousand dollar Sony laser projector and oh yeah, three five like a one thirty eight two three five to one screen. And I think we added the Lumigen and I mean, yeah. Jason's grasp of how video is supposed to work. And, and it just, it, the guy just blew me away and just the way he handled the client and interacted with the client and doesn't act like he knows everything in the planet. And it's, and, and, yeah, I mean, it was, it was awesome experience. It's not, you know, it's, and that's really what it is, man. Like it's, 
it's about connecting with the customer and finding out what they're into and what they're expecting and just teaching them how the system works. That's right. all it is. And, you know, we, a lot of times, I mean, I've, I've been, you know, I've, I've been playing with this stuff my whole life, but I've been getting a paycheck for it since 99 and I've been calibrating these high-end systems since like, Oh, seven, Oh, eight. Audio about people don't yeah. know. I mean, you, you're an expert on, you are, dude, you're a high-end audio guy. I mean, we, yeah. We, hours of conversations about it you know yeah and you know at, at the end of the day it's um when somebody buys something whether it's a tv or a set of speakers or whatever it is it doesn't it it, it doesn't seem too crazy to ask that those products perform the way they're supposed to perform and yeah. the only way that you're going to be able to make this pair of speakers or this TV look good in this room is by going to the room and analyzing it and figuring out how to make that room better. Gene and Don, you guys can both attest to this. I can take the nicest pair of speakers in the world. Doesn't matter. I put them in a warehouse with concrete floors and metal yeah. walls. It sounds terrible, right? And then I Thank put you. it in a proper room and it sounds right. And yeah. people always want to rag and dog on the products when they're not performing correctly. Meanwhile, their room sucks. It, well, they it, go, they spend too much time tinkering around uh, with their cables. I, I would rather have lesser product in a better room than better Guys, product in a lesser room, period. I cannot tell you how many times I have helped somebody design a budget system, but mm -hmm. in a good room, and it right. destroys right. some high end systems. You know, you take like an, I, there was one down in South Florida. I have off the top of my head. It was an Epson 6050. So a, what, $3,000, $4,000 mm -hmm. projector. Yeah, 4000 A 96-inch screen, so not too big. Wow. The room was completely light controlled and dark. He had good sources. All the equipment was connected correctly and set up correctly. And he had a nice dark room, a not out of control, overly big screen. And he sat relatively close. And I'll tell you what, guys, that system for being maybe $20,000 ripped. It was awesome. And yeah. I've also been in rooms before where I have Sony 5000 ESs or JVCs or whatever high-end projectors you want. And the customer has a 180-inch screen and yellow walls. And right. it doesn't look – it's not, not oh, yeah. great. It's just not great. So yeah. the, the biggest advice I can tell people right now today is build the system around the room. Number one, number two, make sure all the stuff is set up correctly. You have to do that with test equipment. You have to do that with test patterns. That doesn't mean go out and buy a $5,000 test pattern generator. That means download some test patterns, throw some on a thumb drive, buy a disc like Spears and Munsell. And at the very, very, very least, make sure you're in a better mode. Make sure your black level and white level is set correctly. Make sure you're in a good color temperature that's not way too blue or something like that. Make sure the edge enhancement isn't cranked up and the sharpness isn't cranked up. Turn off all that extra motion junk. And for about 30 minutes worth of work, you can make any TV or any projector look way better than it would look out of the box. Now, if you want to take it to the next level and spend four or five hours on it, pay somebody like me to come really tweak it and bring out you know, 30 grand with a test equipment. Sure, that's great. Let's do it. Let's really geek out. But putting it in a better mode, setting white level, setting black level, picking a color temperature, getting the edge enhancement, getting the motion correct, and maybe if you have an eye for it, maybe getting the gamma right, those six or seven things, boom, you're really, really close to being referenced. So wow. that leads up to this question here. I was going to just show it, and you kind of answered it. This person wants to know the average person doesn't have any calibration gear. How do they calibrate their 4K TV? Easy. You, you know, you can only, you know, depending on what you have at your disposal for, for tools, you can only go so far. But if you got something as simple as the Spears and Munsell disc, you can at least set the most important things, white level, black level. We just talked about it. The most important thing to the picture is dynamic range. So if you can pick white level and you can pick black level and you can get those things under control, you're already leaps and bounds above anybody else. And, you know, for a TV, for a TV, it's pretty easy, right? Because, you know, you might have a bright room, you might have a dark room, and there's maybe a couple of variables. But for a projector, there's way more variables. The size of the screen, the material of the screen, the color of the screen, the reflectivity of the screen, 
the color of your walls, how far away you sit. You know, there's a gazillion little things. So if you can just buy a disc, pop it in, hit play, set a couple of levels, you're already gonna be way, way, way better than out of the box. So at the very minimum, grab one of those discs. If you don't have the budget for one of those discs, you can download some free test patterns. They are out there, they, they do exist. But those discs, man, the, the Spears and Munsell disc for like 30 bucks or so, is yeah, you, really, really good. Yeah. Well, well the only thing, the only thing about problem. that, Jason, is the new Spears and Munsell disc is very difficult for an average person to use. It's very technical. They, they, yeah. Yeah. They don't, they don't give you an explanation of what the tests do. I mean, I, the first Spears and Munsell disc was like so straightforward. You hit the this up button. One, yeah. <laughs> it told you everything. It, this one just, blew, I mean, the one they sent me, the most recent one, I was like, I don't know what to do with this. And I'm, doing this for a living and I don't know what to do with it. I was going to ask you about it. You know, but the other, the other question I have for you too, is one thing that makes it difficult for consumers, you get an Epson projector, like the one I have the 6050 UB, you go and you set your black levels, you get your, your contrast levels, you get your color all right and standard depth. Then you have a separate set of calibrations for UHD and the stupid projector doesn't automatically switch to that mode nope. when it sees a UHD signal. Some projectors nope. do, like the pro, the JVC does. Yep. Why isn't this a standard thing? Why do you want to make it so hard yep. for consumers? Because they'll put on a UHD disc and they're like, it's not bright enough. Right. Um, we've 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 been complaining about things like this since I've been in the field, and you know, just something as simple as, hey, can we at least get all the manufacturers in a room together? to agree on what to call their brightness setting, for God's sakes. We can't even get them <laughs> to do that, right? Yeah. So getting them to all sort of like work correctly and all work the same when it comes to HDR is a total, total crapshoot. And, you know, I've, I've, I've said this for a couple of years now, and um, I have some colleagues of mine like Chris Deering and uh, several others who will agree with me on this. A HDR with projectors is really, really tough right now. Um, do you get a more dynamic and more colorful picture than SDR? Yes. But is it is a projector displaying that content correctly? No. And we know it because we can measure it. So when we, when we look at things like the uh, ST2084 curve for HDR, most flat panels today can follow that curve just right. And, you know, that's the whole thing about HDR is it's an absolute standard. So, you know, 10% gray must be this bright. 20% gray must be this bright 30. It's an absolute set in stone system. So if you have an 1800 lumen projector on a 150 inch screen with yellow walls, you know, those levels are not going to line up the way they're supposed to. Is it more dynamic and more colorful than SDR? Yeah, a little bit, right? It's cool and it looks good, but we're not even remotely close to a point yet. Where we're able to get these projectors to do anything remotely close to HDR. Um, now the good news is, is we have some of these manufacturers right now doing some really cool stuff with their dynamic tone mapping, like JVC and you know Panasonic and some of their Blu-ray players. They have the tone mapping built into the player, which is really cool. You go into the player and you tell it, you know, you take a light meter and you measure the maximum light output of a projector in the screen, and and you maybe it's you know maybe that's 150 nits, and you go into the Panasonic Blu-ray player and you tell it my output is 150 nits and it'll tone map pretty close to what it's supposed to tone map to. So there are kind of ways around it and there are ways to, to, to kind of make it look correct for what it is, but we're nowhere near a point right now where projectors and HDR are doing anything remotely close to what flat panels are doing. We're, we're, right. we're, we're still like, we don't know what's going to happen with that. And honestly, if, if, you know, if we're just, you know, sitting around having a beer, having this conversation, um, my, opinion is that when we start getting into some of these micro led walls to where they're affordable or or at least some really big oled panels like we're starting to hear rumors about 100 plus inch oled panels i don't know what's going to happen with projectors i really don't you have yeah. christy and barco and panasonic and they're and they're well, all made in these tile systems now and it's like uh, guys what's good what, you know what's well, going to near, happen near field projectors are kind of taking over yeah. now too yeah Larger yeah. venues are always going to need it. I mean, this is not economically right. possible right now, but I mean, you're right. I've got many clients now. We've got, I'm, I'm doing two projects right now that have 98 inch LED TVs. And I was trying to put a projector and they're like, look, man, you know, I just really want that TV look. Um, and 
Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. What, what, what's going to come from it? Um, so Jay, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Is there anything you could do? Say we, we have a client or somebody that contacts us and they're in an area where they just don't have access to an ISF guy, which is pretty limited. I mean, you know, there's only so many sure. calibrators. Is that, is there anything you can remotely do to kind of help somebody out with that? Or is it kind of, well, that's a there? really good question. Um, and you know, it's funny because we've sort of like had, you know, conversations about, is there any way to remotely calibrate a system? You know, cause you know, for somebody like me, I've got a gigantic suitcase full of stuff. It's 30 grand worth of gear. I'm lugging it everywhere. I'm loading it up in the car and I'm taking it to someone's house and, you know, and I'm setting it all up and it's this whole big thing. Right. And it's like, man, is there any way, if there has to be some way for us to do this remotely or, or an easier way to do this. And, you know, I honestly, I think there is. And, you know, will it come with a level of precision of <clears throat> somebody like me coming out? Maybe not. Is it close? It's damn close. Wow. And, you know, we, wow. we've, we, we've thought of a couple of things, right? Like we have programs that are out there. They're easy to use and free some cases like TeamViewer. So if you have the calibration program on your computer, Don, and I remote into your computer, I can control everything, right? Oh, absolutely. So, absolutely. You know, if you think about this logistically, you know, if, if a week before this appointment we had, I shipped you some gear and gave you instructions on how to set it up. And then I just remote it into your computer and did it from there. There's nothing stopping us from doing something like that. Well, and that's super cool. I've, I've experimented with it a little bit and it, it's worked well. You know, it's like, you know, there's, there's certain things that I need to see about the room, you know, with my own eyeballs. But if I have somebody on the other end kind of describing it to me and telling me, Oh yeah, I can close this window and I can do this and I can do that. Then, and take you know, and you, yeah. Right. Right. So yeah, there, like there is, there is some room in there somewhere for some sort of like remote calibration. Um, it's, it's very new to us. It's nothing we've ever really done in the past, but we've That's definitely nice. talked about yeah. it. Yeah. And we've definitely, yeah, so I wanted, to, I wanted to give a quick, there's a super chat here and uh, from awesomeness, Caleb, and you kind of covered this already about making sure your room is dark, getting oh. the black level of your room right first. That's a good comment right there. Black. Yep. Dark. Yeah, but you're a dark soul anyway, man. That's a bat cave over there. <laughs> I mean, guys, the number one most important thing to our eyeballs is dynamic range. Mm -hmm. So if I have a lamp on and white walls and all these other things, all of that light that's coming off the TV or off the screen bouncing off that white wall and then bouncing back into my eye, that is robbing me of contrast. So 100%, uh, what's his name? Caleb, awesome, awesomeness Caleb, 100% correct. If you are designing a reference theater room and you want your video to be top notch, make the room as dark as possible. And you know, I, it's, it's really easy to make the room black. Everybody can do that. It's super easy to do that. What's hard is making the room dark, but also making the room cool. You know, it's, we, right. we, it's, it's really interesting to me when I see a room where they've pulled off both it's dark and they've also pulled off. It's a cool freaking room, Yeah, you know, and that's, that's the tough thing. And I'll, I'll tell you from experience, the, the best thing you can do, it's kind of like audio, right? With audio, there's certain things that you want to make sure right away. First reflections, mm -hmm. crossovers, going in the speakers, uh, you know, setting your levels, setting well, your even your, even before that, you want to make the room quiet, just like the dynamic right. range. Yeah, of yeah the darkness. Yeah. And I start with air conditioner. Power. I start with power. Do we have do we have proper power with the HVAC system? The biggest thing I found in media and theater rooms is they get hot. And also right. you air conditioner do we have diffusers so when there's a quiet passage in the movie and the ac kicks on it's not whistling right. and driving your movie i mean do we have the right distance i mean there's so many factors that go into a really killer room like yeah. one that that transports you to the worlds of lucas or spielberg you know not just a room oh it's cool but you know what i mean you, you're right yeah. you're right on the money. Guys, that, and that's the whole point right like we're you know we are trying to build an experience for the customer. I, I want that customer to be able to sit down and watch something like Lord of the Rings. And I want them to disappear from their real world for Whoa. three hours. Right? And, 
and, and you're really focused on what's in front of you. Right. And it's really hard to do that when you hear the when you hear an ambulance go by outside and you hear the air conditioner kick on right. or you're or seeing a reflection from a lamp in the other side of the room. You know, we're right. trying to build an experience for these customers. And the and and Gene's exactly right. When in, in audio, it's about lowering the noise floor. Mm -hmm. And in video, guess what? Lower the noise floor. <laughs> and how do you do that? Make the room dark. And the 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 big things I can, the the number one or two things I can tell people off the bat. One of the best things you can do right now today to improve the picture quality on your video system is make the wall behind the TV black. Bingo. It, you get more contrast. Well, uh, uh, just no more contrast. Flat black, a flat black, not yeah. any black. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. There, of course, there, there's some things, and you know, if you want, if you really want to follow the rules correctly, you do want a flat or a satin sort of finish. You don't want it to be real reflective. It should be a neutral black, and I know that sounds kind of funny, but there are some black paint out there that's tinted a certain color. Right. So uh, there, there's a company out there. They make a um, I forget off the top of my head, Gene, maybe you know, but um, they make a like a Munsell gray, like an appropriate gray, neutral gray paint. And you can get it in black, you can get it in dark gray, you can get it in medium gray, you can get it in light gray. So, you know, these are really the colors that we should be using to paint our walls when we build a, a good high quality video system. But just having the walls neutral, not making the screen too big, sitting in the right place and getting just your basic levels correct Guys, that is like 90% of it right there. And yep. to squeeze out that last 10%, I come in with my light meters and with all my fancy equipment and I squeeze out that last 10%. The problem is, and what I've seen for over a decade is most people out there are not even taking the first steps. They're plugging mm -hmm. the TV in, they're turning it on. It's in Torch energy mode. savings mode, which they don't realize and that's okay. And that's how they're just watching it. And they're like, oh man, my OLED looks great. I'm like, oh yeah, cool. What mode is it in? Um, APS mode or vivid mode? And I'm like, I'm like, man, I'm like, <laughs> do this, this, and this. And they go, holy crap, I can't believe it. So, you know, my whole point, guys, is when you buy a TV, you buy a projector, you buy any kind of video product that's that's going to make a difference with the picture, you know, at least, at least have some basic test patterns, white level, black level, whether you get those from a Spears and Munsell disc or you download them for free or you stream them off YouTube or wherever you get them from, um, at least do that the very minimum. You can see shadows better. You can see bright detail better. Your dynamic range is close to what it should be. That's the most important thing. From there, it's just tweaking more and more and more and more and more. But that's the important stuff, at least. So I got a question for you. So I know recently Gene has kind of cracked the code on how companies rate receivers, how the how power ratings actually work. Because as consumers, most people buy on specs. And the, the same with video, some video products will have a gazillion to one contrast ratio or 37,000 yeah. lumens. Maybe like I always explain contrast ratio is the ratio from the darkest grays to the brightest whites. There, you know, there's no, that I, I try to take people off of this, this um, spec mode because yeah. you, it's just not a good way to buy a product. Well, you know, you guys, you know, especially you, you two for sure have a lot of background in audio. And uh, I know Don and I, we've had conversations. Um, I, of course, as a 16 to 20 year old American male was really into car audio. And oh, yeah. you know, we did a lot of really cool car stereo stuff back in, back in the day. But um, you know, there was always this, this oh, with, with amplifiers, right? It's like, Oh, we've got this, you know, Rockford Fosgate amplifier and it's, you know, 3000 Watts or whatever. And, you know, PM, how do they measure that? Where does that yeah. come from? Right. And we, we always called it, and Don, maybe you remember this and Gene, maybe you've heard this before too, but we called it the WLS number, the wind lightning strikes number. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sure. If, if, if this amplifier gets, you know, 15 volts, and it puts out 300 watts at five percent right. distortion across right. all bands. You know, yeah, it's putting out X it's amount of never power. Have it, car, ever. It right. It's never. It's never real, guys. Right. It's it's just not. And you know, we we talk about peak power versus RMS power, and we start talking about the science behind it and the math behind it, and how much voltage comes in, and how impedance of the speakers, and how much wattage goes out. 
it's all a formula, right? This isn't black magic. This is science. And it's the same exact thing when it comes to video. You have a projector or a TV that says, you know, a TV right now will say 4,000 nits. And that might be true if it's in vivid mode and the backlight's cranked up all the way and the contrast is cranked up all the way and the white balance blues cranked up all the way. Yeah, that TV might be doing 3,000 nits. But by the time we actually calibrate it and give it the correct white point, make it track correctly and make it look the way it's supposed to look, now we're half of that. And it's the same exact conversation with amplifiers. So, you know, can you tell something about a TV from the specs? A little bit. You can tell, like, you know, if the contrast ratio on an OLED says infinity to one and a contrast ratio on an LCD says a million to one, the OLED has more potential, I guess you can say. But, like, it doesn't really tell you a whole heck of a lot about how the picture is going to look. They're just mm -hmm. numbers. A lot of it's made up by the marketing teams who make a lot of money slapping stickers and slapping things on the box. You know, we have things with energy savings that we don't really care about. We have contrast ratios that we almost don't care about. Maximum nits that we almost don't care about. Again, it's all numbers. It's all fluff. You're not going to know until you get it into the room, adjust the levels for that room and throw a meter on it and measure it. You're not going to know until you do those things. And also really good reviews from really credible people. I mean, there's so much fluff. There's so many influencers out there talking about products where they just trying to get free products. I mean, and yeah. to grow marketing, they're not really giving detailed in-depth reviews of yeah. products. And, and, and that's, is, that is a problem on YouTube now. There's a lot of influencers that uh, are just, they're and, collecting uh, products yeah. and selling people it. People trying to demo speakers through the sound of YouTube and have you oh, make it, yeah. uh, oh, it. Dude, there's tons of people doing it. And they, and they yeah. want to defend the quality of their mics. I'm like, bro, really? Yeah. And you know, we've, we've seen in the past many, many times people trying to show the difference between the Sony OLED and the LG OLED. And they're, they're using a camera to show the two. And you just, you can't, you, you can't do that. You know, there, there are some extremely reputable YouTube guys out there. There are some very good ones, sure. but you know, sure. with the five or six really good ones, there's five or 600 really bad ones. Yeah. So, you know, you just have to like, for anybody out there who might be shopping for a TV or, or researching video type stuff or, or whatever, you know, audio type stuff or whatever, you know, try to at least watch like more than one video, more than one review and, and really good to get a good idea. And, and, and Don's right. And Gene, you're right too. You know, you can, you can kind of tell these guys, you know, who are advertising, you know, their, their channels are set up a certain way and they, they use certain words and you can almost kind of like feel some of these guys out, but the probably, there still are some very good reputable reviewers. So, so out one, there. I want to, one Be video awesome. channel I want to shout out to, um, I, I never really talked to him, but I have a lot of respect for as a, as a YouTube channel called HDTV tests. I don't know if you've yeah, ever seen them. They're really yeah. good. So really, uh, good. really good. So Vincent Tio, um, he's a calibrator. He's been calibrating in the field for many years um, he's an ISF guy. He went to the class years ago and, um, he is one of the, one of the better guys out there. I will say, uh, in fact, he's probably, I would say one of the best, um, oh, yeah. he, he has the most up-to-date equipment. He, he's on top of this stuff, like almost like nobody else out there unbiased. And, and he's, he's unbiased and, you know, he goes out there and he gets a TV and he measures it and he tells you what he finds. And that's really what, that's all we care about. Like, what do the measurements say? You know, I, I, we don't really care too much about, you know, all the fluff and all the, all the pretty language and all the things. If I put a light meter on this TV and I measure it, what does that measurement say? I don't care what brand it is or what cost it was. I want to know what that measurement was. And that's really where Vincent really shines is he's really involved with the science behind it. He really mm -hmm. cares about the performance of things. And uh, he's certainly one of the better guys out there. I would 100% agree with you. So, I want to I, I yeah. pop this question up real quick because it's very basic and we might be talking over some of the people that are watching. And maybe, Jason, you could just give a dumb, a quick answer to this. Yeah. What is black and what is white level? I mean, okay, they're so, labeled differently on each TV, obviously, but what's the essence of it? Yeah. So what we're really talking about here is contrast, right? And the whole thing with contrast is we want the display, whether it's a projector or a TV or a cell phone or whatever, we want the display to show as much dynamic range as possible. So let's start real simple. What is dynamic range? Dynamic range is the difference between the darkest and the brightest part of the picture. 
Now, here's the kicker. When you buy a TV from anywhere, it doesn't matter the brand, doesn't matter where you got it from. 99% of the time, the white level is cranked up too high and the black level is cranked down too low. So that gives you a lot of dynamic range. But here's the problem. If I'm watching a dark TV show or a dark movie, I can't see Batman getting out of his car. It's just a black blob. Well, or the Game of Game of Thrones, that one episode in the last season. Season eight, episode five. Really complained about that. Everybody freaked out. You know, that was such a big deal, Don, that I oh, wrote an article the next day telling people, <laughs> hey, you know all that calibration crap I've been yelling at you about for the last decade? Yeah. Did you watch yeah. Game of Thrones last night? That's why I've been yapping about this. Even drunk, I was able to, I was bitching. I was like, oh my God, look at this. This is the artifacts. Right, God. right. No, shut so, up. The whole, the whole entire goal when you talk about dynamic range is to get the biggest difference you possibly can between dark and bright, but right. also you want to see the details up there as well. So if I look at a cloud in the sky, it's not just a big white blob. I can actually see the fluffiness of the right. cloud. Or if I'm watching the Planet Earth episode of, uh, you know, it's Antarctica and there's a, you know, a, a polar bear sliding down the mountain. I don't want to see just his black eyes and black nose. I want to see the white polar bear against the brighter white background. So having the big giant difference, but also being able to see details is really what we're going for. And it's funny because when we calibrate a display, the first thing we look at is contrast and brightness. And when we do all the other things in between, the last thing we look at is contrast and brightness. It's so important that we check it multiple times throughout the calibration. So I should be able to see lots of detail in the brightest parts of the picture. And I should be able to see lots of detail in the darkest part of the picture, but the blacks should be black and the whites should be white. And if the white level is too low, you might be able to see lots of detail, but the picture has no dynamic range. It's washed out. It's so Jason, black, I have I have a yeah. question. For, I'll, I'll yes. say, finish your point and then I have a question for you. If the black level is too high, you have a washed out picture and your blacks look milky and gray. If your black level is too low, all these details in our black shirts that we're all wearing, it right. looks like a black blob. Right. So the whole goal is as much dynamic range as possible, but also being able to see details in the dark and the bright, just like audio as much dynamic range as possible, but with clear highs and detailed and clear lows. It's the same stuff, guys. No highs, no lows. <laughs> <Yeah>. What? <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. B word. This so Jason, so cool. sorry. Here, yeah, here's, here, here's a problem that plagued me. I wanted to ask you, and then we're going to wrap this up because it's been an hour. I oh, had wow, a, wow, yeah. yeah, it goes fast. I had, a, <laughs> I think I had a first generation fire stick and a fire TV. I had all the yeah. first generation ones, right? They don't do Atmos. Um, but anytime I had them plugged into my Samsung Q9, a 2017 model, it, anytime there was a dark scene, it got completely crushed. It looked like oil droplets all Ugh. over the screen. Is that from the fire TV stick or is that because it was in the wrong mode? It, like the REC mode on the TV was not mapping correctly with the fire. It was terrible. Like it was unwatchable. Amazon was yeah. unwatchable. Netflix was unwatchable. Dark scenes would just look like oil and water. Yeah, it's it's kind of hard to say, you know, just based on, you know, that situation there. You know, there's a lot of moving parts there. It could be a number of things. It could be any one of those things that you may have mentioned. One thing I have noticed about certain streaming devices like the Fire Stick and Roku and Apple TV is they don't really have any adjustments for the video itself. So where you might see in an Oppo or a Panasonic or, or Pioneer Elite type Blu-ray player, you might have some brightness and contrast and, and settings to, to kind of compensate for some of these things. But in, in a lot of those inexpensive streaming devices, Chromecast, Fire Sticks, et cetera, you might not have any settings at all besides output resolution and color space or, or something very, very, very basic. So, you know, there, there's the, the, the good news is, Gene, is that it's really easy to tell what's causing the problem. If, if I take a... I would take a signal generator and I would plug it into the TV and look at my black level. And if you don't have a signal generator, no big deal. Again, you can download test patterns and you can get them from almost anywhere these days. So if I plug in a generator or if I look at a test pattern 
through a USB stick or whatever, if I stream it, whatever from YouTube, I can set my black level, right? Black level looks good. I'm happy. Everything looks fine. And then I play a movie from some source and all of a sudden the blacks in the movie are super crushed. I know it's not the TV. I know mm -hmm. it's the content itself or it's the streaming device itself. And here's how you can figure it out. If you're watching a really dark movie and you're like missing all your shadows and you're like, what the hell? My black levels on my TV is, is correct. What's going on here? So here's a really good trick for people. <clears throat> Find a dark scene, press pause. Go to your TV, crank up the black level. If the black level comes up and all you're doing is making the blacks grayer and you're not seeing more shadows, it's not the TV. It's the content. Now, if you crank up the black level and you're starting to see more detail in the picture, then yeah, you, you might be off. Your brightness might be off. But if you crank up the black level and the blacks are getting grayer and you're not seeing more detail, sorry, it's in the content and there's nothing you can do about that. So do you well, think that all streaming devices aren't created equal then? No, gosh, no. Oh, gosh, no. Gosh, no. Gosh, no. Gosh, no. Really great. The no, I, I, I can take a test pattern that I have on my computer that I know is correct. And I can put that same test pattern on a thumb drive and stick that thumb drive into like a Roku or something. And the test pattern will look off. Hmm. And then I can take that same test pattern and cast it to my TV from my phone. It looks completely different. So yes, you're correct. Not all streaming devices are created equal, which is why they should have basic controls like black level, right. white level. And all of your nice Blu-ray players do, and they always have, and they always probably will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speaking of what Blu-ray, now that they broke our hearts with Oppo, what 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 do, what do you recommend for a client now? What you know, reasonable products? That you know, I, you know, my whole, I'm supposed to be agnostic, right? That's just. Oh, I know, but we can't. I, I'm, I'm supposed to rely on the science and what do the test patterns tell me and what's doing what and. <clears throat> but I'm a human being and I'm going to be a little biased. That's just, sorry. That's just how it is. <clears throat> if I were buying a Blu-ray player right now, it'd probably be a Panasonic. Okay. They have three models, 150 bucks to a grand. And the two expensive ones video wise are exactly the same. They're different yeah. audio wise. If you're a big two channel guy and you need a really nice analog mm -hmm. output, get yeah, the thousand yeah. dollar one. Right. But with that being said, there's a, LG I've seen for about 99 bucks. Um, there's a couple of Sony's. Right. There's a Pioneer Elite. You know, the, the funny thing is about Blu-ray players right now is there's not a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So the yeah. good ones are all pretty good, you know. Okay. But one of the things I really, really, really like about the Panasonic is, you know, if you're watching, let's say you're watching 1,000 nit content, which is, I don't know. 90% of my discs up here, a thousand nits. You Lord of the Rings trilogy, man. Somebody mentioned right. that. Well, yeah. yeah. So let's say you're watching 1,000 nit content, but you have an 800 nit OLED. Mm -hmm. What's happening to 801 to 1,000 nits? Guess what? It's gone. It's clipped. That's how HDR works. <clears throat> but if I can tell the Panasonic that I have an 800 nit display, the Panasonic will tone map the signal yeah, yeah. so that Oh, I can still see all the bright details, right? Oh. So, and it's really easy. You know, you measure the display and then you go into the Panasonic menu and you tell it, you know, how many nits the display is or the video system is, and it'll tone map to that. So instead of having a, you know, take a movie like Mad Max, which is 4,000 nits, right. really bright in some areas with the guitars and the fire and stuff, especially when they're driving through the desert. You know, if you look at that stuff on a TV with, wrong tone mapping all those bright orange details are just clipped if you see it tone mapped correctly all the bright orange details are there so you know the the whole thing with hdr again is it is an absolute system and if we're going to view it correctly we need to do it in such a way that the eotf is tracking correctly and the only way to really know if that's happening or not is with some test equipment uh, obviously right. obviously i mean i i think gene i think I know we're going to have Jason on as a regular uh, across Audioholics in general, but um, I'd, I'd like to pick this up next week and maybe if Jason's got time and the like, because this is such a, we just opened the well here. I mean, it's a huge oh, subject yeah. and, and we've, we've got the audio covered. I mean, we truly do, but the video is the 800 pound gorilla and there's just 
so few, like we just talked about, people that really know how to explain it. Now, I want you to, what, Jason, what's your YouTube? You have your own YouTube page, right? Yeah, I, I, I do, but honestly, I don't post a, a lot to it. Um, yeah, we're, 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 yeah, well, we're, where most of my videos are at are on the um, Meridio YouTube page. Right. Okay. So it's okay. uh, M U R I D E O. And then also there's a, a, a lot of good stuff on the uh, AV Pro Edge YouTube page as well. Um, right. You guys would certainly appreciate this. Over summer, mm -hmm. I did probably 25 to 30 hours with Anthony Grimani on room acoustics and speaker specs no, and no. audio stuff in general. And it is really, really fun stuff to listen to. Um, but between the AV Pro Edge and the Meridio YouTube channels, um, you can see all kinds of stuff there on – uh, video distribution and how to do it correctly and calibration and, and just lots and lots of cool stuff and in, in involving those two things. So feel free, check those out. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I try to be as, as helpful as possible when it comes to people asking questions. So feel free, email me, uh, Jason at Meridio.com. And uh, if you have any specific questions, I'll, uh, I'll do my best to answer those as best as I can. So, so it's a really it's a really small world here because we have um, Anthony Grimani is actually going to be sending me some acoustical products to put in my theater room and he's, he's been, yeah I, so it's, he's he's one of the best you know and if if you had to learn audio from somebody besides maybe Doctor Tool or <laughs> somebody you know somebody like that uh, Anthony <laughs> is probably one of the best people on the planet to learn audio from uh, nice. whether it's acoustics or speaker design or or whatever. Uh, he's a, he's a fantastic guy. He's super funny and really easy to talk to and, uh, very knowledgeable and, and always, always very open to share his, his yeah. brain. We should get him on here, Gene, to stream in, you know. Yeah, absolutely. The, yeah. He's, he's the man. He's so, Anthony, fantastic. So Jason really, he travels the world. And what's one of the cool things is like, you know, where's Waldo? Where in the hell is Jason at? Oh, he's, <laughs> yeah. in, he's in Australia. <laughs> the shrimp on the barbie teaching, teaching people how to be the professional calibrators or he's in Amsterdam working. Yeah. Um, it, it <laughs> I was, mean, it's awesome. I mean, this, the amount of people, I don't quite realize the amount of horsepower that we're bringing into this right now. I mean, dude, you're, you, you know, I'm not worthy. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's all good, man. You know, like I said, man, you know, I've, I, I, I'm one of the lucky people who can, you know, honestly say that I do my, um, I, I, my hobby is my job. You know, I've, I've been into this stuff my whole life. My great grandfather, uh, wasn't, was, a uh, you know, after he retired, he opened a radio and a TV repair shop, like through the seventies. Uh -huh. So I, you right. know, I kind of grew up soldering and troubleshooting and swapping out tubes and tinker kind of thing. And, you know, I, I, I grew up in, in, you know, Don, I know you'll appreciate this gene, you too, but, um, I, I grew up in a world where I spent weekends listening to records with headphones and reading lyrics. And, um, Funny you I, said. this is, you know, this is, this is a hobby for me and it's, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, I, I spend my weekends listening to music and, <laughs> you know, watching it's, all and about the music. And it's all about yeah. the music and the movie and the artist. I mean, all of this science and all this nerding out, the, the, the ultimate goal is if you're a do it yourself or, take this information or if you just want to pay somebody pay somebody like hd 2020 so we can deliver this this level of oh my god this, you know a room because all these little things make all the difference on on just throwing money at something yeah. not enjoying it or really getting into it or letting yeah. somebody do it for you and, and really experiencing it you know at at, at the end of the day I, I say this a lot so stop me if you've heard this before but at the end of the day what are we actually trying to achieve here what are we chasing here at the end of the day, guys, it's the content. It really is. You know, I yeah. can have the best projector and the in the perfect room and the perfect TV and the perfect audio system, but if I put in crappy content or a crappy disc, it's not going to do what I want. And so, I keep telling this to Don because he listens to Millie Vanilli records like an audio <laughs> yeah. file. You no, know, it's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, when, Jason, when, the last last question here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I look at this kind of question. I see this all the time. Should I just wait for for the for the next five years for X Y Z model to come out with no. with levitating I features? Nope. I nope. hate that logic because nope. it's like you you could be dead in two years. Let's yeah, be honest. Nope. If if you want to if you want a TV, go out and buy a TV. 
Yeah. And you know, the, the average household, the average family replaces their TV every seven years. Guys mm -hmm. like me and Gene and Don, we might be every two every years, year. every year, every three years. Yeah. And you know, that's okay. There's lots of us out there that, that are like that. But well, if you're, if you're constantly waiting for the next best thing, you're going to be waiting until you die. It, yeah. There's always, there's always something coming. There's always something going to be better next year. It's just the world of audio video and the world of televisions. If you want a nice TV, go fill out a Best Buy application and get your financing and your 24 months, no interest and go buy that 77 inch OLED or, or whatever it is and, and enjoy it for a couple of years. And when you're ready for something new, go buy something new, but uh, so, don't, don't wait on the next best thing. Cause we'll be waiting forever. The, one of the cool factors about just on a personal note, you know, Gene and I are really good friends. We work out together. We talk, we talk about, movies and tv shows and how ridiculous and uh, and how good the soundtrack was and when you and i talk jason we're talking about this album and and how it's good about the content we we actually that's what we do we we mm -hmm. we rap about oh dude did you and i, I just got this 85 inch sony tv man and i'm sitting there going wow this thing kicks ass you know it's yeah. like you know i'm or i'm watching this this new projector that's out i mean we we love this stuff. I mean, just like Dude, my got, my head is still spinning from the last episode of Mandalorian. It's like, oh, wow, we got real yeah. Star Wars yeah. again. Yeah, that, that, yeah one that. of my one of my favorite movies of all time. Oh yeah, Jaws. Love Jaws. The transfer on this looks amazing. You would never think that it was shot when it was shot. They did an awesome job, and you know, it's really funny. That the the, the the I'll I'll wrap up with this because if if you guys don't stop me, I'll go forever. The, okay. the, the funny thing about HDR, and you can you can really compare this to SACD, for example. Right. When you see a movie that you've seen 10 million times, like Jaws or right. Wizard of Oz or whatever, and you see it in HDR for the first time, Killer it, sound. Is, it is it's it is genuinely like seeing the movie again for the first time. You know, when, when I first got, you know, dark side of the moon on super audio CD or nine inch nails, downward spiral on super audio CD, it sounds brand new. I get, I get it on vinyl. It sounds brand new. Right. So, you know, as we're looking at these older movies and these older transfers, you can really start to really see like who's doing a really good job at converting this old analog format into a new, really good high quality digital format for love. Yeah. And, and we're getting to a point right now where the, and, and this is funny because it's always been the opposite. We're getting to a point right now where the content is being mastered at such a level that the TVs and displays have not caught up to yet. So you take a movie like, um, I don't know, um, Blade Runner 2049 or Despicable Me 3. I, I or that soundtrack today. It's a killer yeah. soundtrack. So you have these movies that are mastered at, you know, the brightest peak of the movie might be 10,000 nits, which is kind of the ceiling for HDR. And, you know, the color gamut is humongous and we're seeing these super deep saturated colors, right? But guess what? In 2020, we don't have displays yet that can make that bright of a picture or can make that saturated of a red. So what's going to end up happening is, I might watch Blade Runner 2049 tonight and say, yeah, that looks really good. But five years from now, when I have a TV that does 5,000 nits or yeah. maybe 10,000 nits, finger crossed, with Rec 2020 color, it's going to be like seeing the movie all over again. So, you know, it's, 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 we, we've, we, we're trying our hardest right now to make people understand or, or at least let, let people understand that these movies that they've cherished for so many years have all this potential to look good, but there's always been this bottleneck because of the technology. And we're finally able to like unleash it and see these movies for what they were actually supposed to look like back in the day. And it, if, if you're into this hobby because of an artistic reason, you like the way movies look, you appreciate cinematography and all that good artistic type stuff. This is really right up your alley. Awesome. So, well, guys, anyway. I so, think we are. I think we've we've reached our hour uh, limit here. We usually do cool. about an hour. We're at an hour and twenty now. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I'm, I'm, you're going to see people bitching down below. This is too long. Well, yeah, I, mean, I mean, that's that's, well. that's that's the nature of the beast. So yeah. I'm actually thinking about making these um, broadcasts available on a, as a podcast format. I started a podcast for audio hogs. I just haven't been really working on it much, but I can convert these YouTube videos into podcasts yeah. so people can. Yeah, whatever, guys. Anything you want to do, I'm I'm available. I'm here. Awesome. I can so, talk about J it all day. <laughs> Jason, Don, thanks guys for being here today. Uh, guys, if you like this video, please thumb it up. Make sure you share it. Um, don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. You become a patron, you help support this channel. We appreciate it. You get to suggest video topics. So if you want to tell us what you like Jason to talk about next, go on our Patreon channel, engage with me. I'll get back to you guys. We'll set this up and we'll have like a, you know, a, a plan of attack next time Jason's on here. Yep, so so good, guys. Ending is keep listening, but we're going to have to have Jason jump in with the keep watching. Man. Keep watching. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going we're gonna to change it just for today. When Jason's here, it's going to be just keep oh, watching. There you go. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> cool. Thank you guys. Thanks for your time. It's fun. All right. With that said, keep watching. <laughs>